Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm McKenna LaPierre, the assistant librarian here at the Greensboro Free Library, and this is Raymond Perkins. Raymond Hi. is a retired middle school social studies teacher, mm -hmm. lives in Derby, Vermont. Yes. He's the father of five and has written five books, and he's going to be reading from his first book here today for us. So please take it away. Thank you. So I'll give you a little bit of background. My first book was The Mystery of the Silver Statue. Um, I got the idea for it way back in 1983 when I first started teaching and I was in Coventry. And I was doing some writing with the kids, uh, teaching some language arts and uh, we were reading each other's stories and the kids really loved my idea, my two pages that I had written. So as years went on and I went on to teach uh, middle school in Barton, uh, I was teaching sixth grade social studies and and it was included uh, Vermont history and geography and so I kind of continued that idea that I had started in Coventry and lo and behold after several years I had a book called The Mystery of the Silver Statue. Um, I sent it to some editors uh, I, I got a good um, pink slip back saying um, okay but what makes this different from others out there on the shelf and so I started thinking about it and I changed the characters because the characters were really kind of nondescript and I decided to use my two sons my eldest sons and one of them struggled with a brain tumor when he was five years old and so um, I kind of used that as a jumping off point and uh, modeled my characters after these two boys so B.T. Stevens became my eldest son, Jeremy, and um, Jimmy Martin, my next oldest, um, who was uh, Jason. And so I, I decided that I, I could insert them into this story because I really loved mysteries and I enjoyed Vermont studies. And from there, I was able to kind of polish it off and, and get it published by a small publishing company in Coventry called Radiant Hen. And after that, I decided um, that for my next books, I would, uh, I would publish them myself, and I do that through uh, Kindle Direct. So anyway, The Mystery of the Silver Statue. I, because I enjoy history and... Uh, a professor at Linden State College, Graham Newell, was uh, the most outstanding history teacher I've ever had, um, and he really loved Vermont history. Um, he really got me excited about Vermont history. So I used the French and Indian War as a kind of a jumping off point for the mystery. And I'll read, uh, I think, the second or part of the second chapter of this book to kind of get you an idea of, of what's going on. At this point, uh, the boys, BT and Jimmy, have gone off on a little fishing expedition. And so they walk by this house called the old Monroe Place, which is supposed to be abandoned, yet Jimmy thinks, or BT thinks, that it, uh, it may be haunted. So that's kind of where we get started in the book. The boys walk p past the place, they see some activity in there, and then they hear some uh, gentlemen uh, or overhear them talking about uh, a map, a treasure map. And so that really piques their interest. So they go to the house, they set up uh, walkie-talkies so they can hear what's going on in the house. And that's where we'll start. Hit the recorder, BT yelled to Jimmy. It was 8.45 p.m. and over the CB came the muffled sound of people's voices. Jimmy glided swiftly over to the tape recorder and they both strained to hear the conversation that was taking place in the Monroe house two miles away. Said it was here, Sid, but where? Rogers, men, statue, don't know, message, library, treasure, here. There was a crackle and a muttering of voices. Then there came the sound of a door slamming and finally silence. The message ended just as suddenly as it began. BT, what the heck were they talking about? Something to do with buried treasure in the library? I don't get it. Let me think, BT answered, waving at Jimmy in an attempt to quiet him down. Rewind the tape and we'll listen to it again. 
Let's write down everything we can make out and take it from there. And that's what the boys did. So I'm just going to jump forward a little bit um, to where BT and Jimmy decide they're going to check out the town library and find out if they can find some more information. Burton Memorial Library was located on Main Street in the center of town. Right behind the local drugstore and the Dollar Tree, everything one dollar. It was built in the late 1800s, but it was a well-kept brick building, and it contained an impressive collection of books. Jimmy and BT walked br briskly across the village common and skipped up the concrete steps of the library, reaching the door just as Miss Crandall, the town librarian, was opening up. Good morning, boys, she said with a startled look on her face. School's been out less than a week. I'm surprised that you boys are looking for summer reading already. We're looking for information, Miss Crandall, BT answered. A book or something. Probably a mystery about someone named Rogers and a statue or buried treasure. Have you heard of anything like that? That's no mystery, boys, she replied, a quizzical expression forming on her rosy cheeks. Their questions had obviously struck a chord with this enthusiastic librarian. Haven't you two studied about Rogers Rangers and Mr. McKelvey's history class? She continued before they could answer. It was obvious from the tone of her voice that the subject was of extreme interest to her. It seemed that Robert Rogers and his band of rangers attacked the St. Francis Indians of Southern Quebec during the French and Indian War. It was sometime in the 18, no, the 1750s, she said. I think it happened at a place the natives called Odenac. Legend has it that after attacking the village, the rangers looted and killed everyone they found. Before leaving, they took a solid silver statue belonging to the Indians. But the statue, given to the Abenakis by French missionaries, was either lost or buried somewhere along the return route. The rangers, who were pursued by Abenaki Indians bent on revenge, were fleeing for their lives. That's really exciting, Miss Crandall, Jimmy answered, his voice shaking with excitement. Do you have a book here about Rogers Rangers? Sure, Jimmy, Miss Crandall replied, stepping gracefully toward the bookshelf on their left. After signing out the book, the boys raced down the steps and up the sidewalk before Miss Crandall realized they were gone. They hurried back to their office and dropped off the book before heading to the inlet to pick up their bikes. Jimmy stooped, or excuse me, Jimmy stopped three times along the way and walked uh, or waited quietly for BT to catch up. It took about 20 minutes to reach the road leading to the Monroe House. They crossed the little brook, and I'm just going to move on here. Then they cased the house for a few minutes before BT and Jimmy decided to move in. Finding an open window, BT struggled through it and opened the back door for Jimmy. Once inside, they checked out the place for anything that might give them a clue to the mystery. Jimmy was in the kitchen changing the battery in the walkie-talkie, and BT was in the cellar going through an old cedar chest when they heard a commotion outside. The front door slammed and someone was in the house before Jimmy could get away or hide. Let go of me, you big ape! Jimmy yelled, battling mightily to get away. Tie him up, Sid. Then search the rest of the house, came the sound of a vaguely familiar voice. Upon hearing those words, BT froze. He searched frantically for a place to hide. He spotted a dark corner behind a pile of cardboard boxes under the staircase. Crawling in, he closed his eyes tightly, waiting for the worst. Moments later, the cellar door opened with a squawk, and the stairs creaked under the weight of someone heavy making their way slowly down the steps. A shadowy figure began to rummage through the boxes under the stairs. BT held his breath, waiting to be discovered. Just as he spotted a hook clawing at the corner of the box that was hiding him from view, the man upstairs called out, Hook, there's no one down there. The kid's alone. Get your metal hook up here, he growled. The kid must have been exploring or something, Hook replied, reaching the top of the stairs. What are we going to do with him? He knows we're here now, grumbled the man called Sid. I don't know. Let's tie him up. Then have something to eat. We can give the boss a call later on. 
Cautiously, BT began to make his way out from behind the boxes and up the stairs. He held his breath, praying that the tread planks wouldn't creak under his feet and give him away. He reached the top step without incident and turned the doorknob slowly to the left. Pushing the door open slightly, he peered out. No one was in sight. So he headed down the hall toward the living room where he thought Jimmy was being held. It seemed to take an eternity to reach Jimmy, who was gagged and tied up on the floor behind the couch. BT was untying the rope on Jimmy's hands when they heard the sound of footsteps coming down the hall right toward them. The boys froze, not knowing whether to run for it or hide. To their amazement, they heard the cellar door swing open and the sound of footsteps descending the stairs. Let's get out of here, BT whispered, pointing to the open window where he'd come in. Jimmy slid the window up as quietly as he could and climbed out. BT was right behind him, but just as his left foot touched the ground and he began to slide his right one across the windowsill, a hand grabbed him by the ankle. He pulled uh, frantically, unable to shake its painful grip. Jimmy's got me, BT screamed. Jimmy reached out and grabbed BT's hand. Their combined efforts freed him from the attacker. It's two kids, the man at the window yelled. Get him, you fool, the other man ordered. Hook's left hand and leg were on the windowsill when a thought hit BT. Maybe it would give them enough time to make a getaway, but he had to act fast. He grabbed the window and pulled down with all his strength. Hook howled in pain as the window slammed onto his arm and leg with a loud crunch. The boys turned and made a mad dash for their bikes. They reached the main road within minutes, pulled their bikes out of the bushes, and sped off down East Brook Road. BT didn't look back until they'd made the turn onto Silver Ridge Road. To his surprise, a car was emerging from the top of the knoll, only a half mile behind them. Here they come, Jimmy, BT yelled. Go, 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 he continued to scream as they flew down the road at lightning speed. BT's legs felt like jelly, but he knew that stopping now would mean facing the wrath of the angry attackers. BT felt a new surge of adrenaline pumping through him as they raced down Silver Ridge Road and turned onto Harrington Street. They pulled into the first driveway on the street, hopped off their bikes and pushed them across the neighbor's lawns, finally emerging on Pleasant Street, only a short distance from BT's house. So the boys have kind of figured out that maybe there's a lot more going on than they first thought. Um, and eventually they do find some information about a treasure map and uh, I won't tell you anymore. But um, that becomes my first book and at the end of the first book, um, typically each book that I've written, I've left a little bit of information right at the end of the last chapter about what the next book is going to be about. So the second book um, becomes the mystery of the Brick Kingdom, which takes place um, on the water in Barton, which is, again, my fictional town of Burton. And then from there, at the end of that, solving that mystery, the boys uh, learn about a mystery further north on the border, in Derby Line, a place called the uh, Haskell uh, Library and Ask, uh, Opera House. and. Uh, so the third book becomes The Mystery of the Haunted Opera House. And my next book to come out will be um, The Mystery of the Mountaintop Treasure, which will then take them to Jay Peak and, and that area to solve another mystery. And uh, in the meantime, I decided to write an adult novel. And that was published uh, two years ago. And that was called Spy Chip Armageddon. Um, so that one can be found on uh, my website as well, which is uh, www.mystery4me.com, the number four. Um, not F-O-U-R, but just the number four. And you'll find all my books there. If you're interested, um, grab a copy and enjoy. Questions? <laughs> Could you tell us who did the illustrations? Sure, I sure they can. Absolutely um, wonderful. Early on, when I was working on uh, the publishing end with the publishers, and 
the publishers offered that I could find someone uh, to do the illustrations myself or they would. It just happened that my daughter-in-law um, has her degree in graphics design and so I asked her if she would do the illustrations and so she did uh, and has done all of the illustrations for my book. Yeah, so that, work, that has worked out nicely. Other questions? Yes? When do you think your next book is going to be released? Um, I'm hoping, depending on the illustrator, um, that will be out sometime before Christmas. And then I'm, I'm kind of looking at... COVID kind of slowed me down a little bit, but um, and I, I started, uh, again, to do a little more writing than I, ha I have just haven't written much for, for a while. And uh, I had another idea, though, for the next book, which is the mystery of the Memphis Magog monster. Um, so I think there's, there's a, a cool story there, but we'll see. Because as I write, I, I usually just kind of let the story unfold. Sometimes it gets stuck. Sometimes um, it, it, it just comes to me. Uh, I can remember in the Brick Kingdom that I really got stuck with where I was going next. And it was quite a struggle. So I had put my, my writing away for about a week or so. And then one day at the kitchen counter, um, breakfast time, I jumped up and I said, I got it! And my daughter, Kendra, was like, what is your problem, Dad? And I said, no, I figured it out. I, I made the leap from where I am to where I want to be. And so that's kind, of, that's kind of the thing with writing. Sometimes it just flows and other times you just get stuck and you have to wait for it to to come to light. Although, with my book um, Spy Chip uh, Armageddon, because I was writing for adults, um, I took an online class with James Patterson, a fairly famous writer, um, and his suggestion was that you set up the whole book chapter by chapter with just maybe a sentence or two, not even a sentence sometimes. This is what the chapter is going to be about, and I did that. Um, and I found that it did flow quite well, uh, all 84 chapters. Um, so it, uh, it, that was an interesting um, trial, I suppose, to, to, to attempt to, to make that leap from children's literature to adult literature. Um, but I did enjoy it. Yes? So could you tell us again where people could find your books? Sure. Um, my website, mainly, mysteryforme.com. Also, if you just go to Amazon and you type in my name, Raymond C. Perkins, Jr., um, it'll take you to my author page, and you'll find it there. And in a few cases, you can find them around, like in Barton. Um, there are a couple of uh, establishments there, Ian e. Brown's. Um, have my books, as well as uh, Taylor's Automotive, uh, but, but mainly Amazon. And that's where my website will take you from, and, and my daughter-in-law also designed the website, um, from, Amaz from uh, the website to Amazon to order books. And you can order them either as um, hard copy or as e-books. Yes. And you write mostly mysteries. Yes, even even uh, the adult story was a mystery, basically. Um, I call it an adult thriller, but same sort of thing. And yeah, that's so that's that's my been my focus, and I guess that's why uh, I write them is because I have enjoyed that. I enjoyed that as a kid reading the kind of mysteries like the um, Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew and and some of those characters and. And, and so that's kind of been my, my focus. All right. Very nice. Well, thank you so much. And once again, mysteryforme.com, number four. Thank you.